Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor James Kraska. And uh, it is indeed a great pleasure for the VIT AP School of Law. First of all, I must thank you for readily agreeing to be part of our uh, board of advisors because uh, we as an upcoming law school in India, we are trying to become a global law school with the guidance and mentorship of the people like you, those who have been exposed to various uh, aspects of international law, particularly maritime law and law of the sea. And first of all, my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to you for being a board of advisors and the mentors of a VSL, that is VITAP School of Law. And the second, I would like to thank you for readily agreeing uh, for my request to give and deliver this lecture in this afternoon and where we have requested to speak on the important aspects of international law, particularly the aspects of law of the sea and maritime law. And thank you very much for that. And with this a few inaugural things, I would like to introduce you to our participants. My dear friends, first of all, I thank you as well for joining with us in this important lecture that is International Distinguished Guest Lecture on International Law by Professor Dr. James Kraska is the chair of the Stockton Center for International Law. And Professor James has been associated with the uh, center so since a long time. And he's expert and professor of international maritime law in the Stockton Center for International Law at the US Naval War College. And the first established chair at the institution and a visiting professor of law and John Harvey Gregory lecturer on World Organization at Harvard Law School. And he also served as a visiting professor of law at the College of Law, University of Philippines, visiting professor of law at Gujarat National Law University in India, Mary Derrickson McCarthy visiting scholar at Duke University Marine Laboratory and a fellow in residence at the Marine Policy Center Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And a few professional highlights, there are many, but I would like to co mention few so that we can have very important um, understanding of our speaker. He's editor in chief of uh, Benedict on Admiralty, International Maritime Law. And as I mentioned, he also visiting professor of John Harvey, Gregory lecturer on the World Organization at Harvard Law School visiting professor of public international law at Gujarat National Law University, Ahmedabad in India. And he has several publications also. And he completed his education from JD Indiana University Murray School of Law, LLM from the University of Virginia School of Law, and SJD uh, from University of Virginia School of Law. And he's a very, very accomplished, a reputed international scholar and in international law particularly international law relating to maritime and also law of the sea. With this brief introduction, now I would like to invite Professor James for this uh, wonderful and important lecture. Thank you very much. Now, may I request James to? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chaka, for that kind introduction, overly generous introduction. What we'll talk about today for the next uh, 45 minutes or so is going to be the South China Sea arbitration. And I'm gonna share my screen and you will be able to uh, think about the South China Sea arbitration as a question of fact and a question of law. Now, let's see, did, I don't think that worked right, did it? I'm going to try that again, okay. Hey, Toto. All right. So, Guys, I would request all of you to mute your audios, please. Okay, thank you. Is it, is it display properly? Yeah. It is, uh, James. Uh, it's, uh, we can see this. Yeah, it's just the slides though, right? It's no notes? 
Yeah, no notes. It's only slides we can see. All right. So as I mentioned, what, what I would like you to think about is that this is a story of fact selection and rule selection. What that means is that as international lawyers, you have to select facts that support your case, and you also have to apply the proper law because sometimes the law is in competition or in tension. And if you can choose your facts or if you can select the law that applies, then you're going to prevail on the case. And this is no more evident than in the South China Sea arbitration, which really shows. Uh, yeah, we can ask if everybody would uh, mute their would mute their. Yeah, Mr. Samrat, uh, you kindly I, mute your uh, audio. I did please. it. I did it all right. Yeah, Somebody's got to cook dinner at the same time, so no problem. I understand. Uh, so what we'll apply are the rules within the Law of the Sea Convention, and that will determine how the case comes out. And you, you may recall that this South China Sea arbitration between the Philippines and China was decided in 2016. This is the graphic of the South China Sea, and you can see here that the essential debate or disagreement is over whether you're going to have a conventional application of the law of the sea in which all states are entitled to a 200 mile exclusive economic zone. And that is depicted on this graphic in the, the pink or, or magenta line. That's 200 miles from shore, as you can see uh, with a donut hole in the middle. Beyond the 200, beyond the EEZ, is high seas. On the other hand, the other rule that could apply would be this nine dash line, this yellow horseshoe shaped line. It's also called the cow's tongue. This is China's claim of some type of historic rights. And China looks to historic law to support that claim. So this is a question of what rules apply. Are the conventional 200 mile exclusive economic zones going to apply? Or is this somewhat ambiguous Chinese historic rights claim going to apply? Now, all parties understand that the law of the sea convention is the, the, the relevant body of law. But the law of the sea makes reference to both an exclusive economic zone, as well as some small reference to historic rights. So remember the exclusive economic zone is that area over which the coastal state has exclusive sovereign rights and jurisdiction over the living and the non-living resources. This means fish and oil and gas. Now, China is actually quite geographically disadvantaged, and this has strategic implications for why it's pushing out on all of its land boundaries. Remember, China has 14 land boundaries, and it feels boxed in. The Middle Kingdom feels surrounded, and this has generated tension in the past with Russia. In fact, China and Russia fought a brief war in 1969, and also, of course, with India. On the maritime side, China also feels surrounded and boxed in. Why? It has South Korea and Japan in Northeast Asia. Both of those are treaty allies of the United States. It also has the Philippines in Southeast Asia, another treaty ally of the United States. There's Taiwan, which is obviously in opposition to China, and even Vietnam, which is both a maritime and land boundary uh, country adjacent to China that has fought conflicts with China in the past. And so China feels frustrated and boxed in. This is China's actual exclusive economic zone versus their rather extravagant maritime claims reaching into the South China Sea. 
Now, why is this dispute coming about just now? Well, it's of course because of the emergence of China as a major power. The emergence of China as a major power is the realism that fuels this case. But the legal, the legal trigger was this claim in 2009 that you see here by Malaysia and Vietnam to claim an extended or outer continental shelf beyond 200 miles. So if we go back to the Law of the Sea Convention, you can see here, as I mentioned, that coastal states are entitled to a 200 mile exclusive economic zone for fish and also for oil and gas. But notice at the bottom, the black line, the continental shelf, the continental shelf in some cases can extend beyond 200 nautical miles and that's called an extended or outer continental shelf. And coastal states may claim exclusive rights to the oil and gas on this extended continental shelf if they can show that it is a natural prolongation of their continental margin. Why do we allow coastal states to do that? Because this continental shelf is deemed to be the alluvial mass of all of the, the, the dirt and the dead dinosaurs and all of the, uh, the vegetation that over millions of years has melted into the ocean. And so it came from the continent and it's separated by the deep seabed, which is flat. And so, so Malaysia and Vietnam submitted a claim that you see overlapped here in red, in which they jointly made a claim for this extended continental shelf from their coastlines. They did this on May 6, 2009. The very next day, China issues a now famous diplomatic note verbal. And what this said was that China has indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea. And you can see here that it, that China's nine dash line claim overlaps this area claimed by Vietnam and Malaysia for their extended continental shelf. So the next day, China issues this diplomatic demarche. It asks for this to be circulated to all of the states of the United Nations, claiming the sovereignty over the islands. And there's between uh, 1,000 and 1,500 of these islands out there. Then it also claims, even more importantly for the law of the sea, it claims sovereignty over the adjacent waters adjacent waters, meaning waters next to the islands. Furthermore, China claims sovereign rights and jurisdiction over relevant waters. What are relevant waters? And then it claims sovereign rights and jurisdiction over the seabed and the subsoil thereof. Well, if you're confused by what China is claiming, then you will join the rest of the world because nobody knows what, a, what adjacent waters means. We do know that coastal states have sovereignty over a territorial sea and that coastal states have sovereign rights and jurisdiction over an exclusive economic zone. But the terms adjacent waters and relevant waters exist nowhere else in in the law of the sea or in any of the cases. So this is a rather ambiguous claim. It suggests that China is claiming a territorial sea and an exclusive economic zone and continental shelf over this area, but nobody is really sure. And still today they're not. So this went to litigation. How could it go to litigation? In the International Court of Justice, like in the current case with Russia and Ukraine, 
This type of dispute cannot go to the International Court of Justice unless both states consent to jurisdiction. The nice thing about the Law of the Sea Convention is that every type of dispute is subject to mandatory compulsory dispute resolution. All the disputes arising in the Law of the Sea Convention, when you join the Law of the Sea Convention, as, in, as India is a party, then the disputes automatically go to the uh, dispute resolution procedures in Part 15. Maybe we could ask somebody to turn off their, mute their... Uh, uh, Kavya. Uh, Kavya, yeah. can I? Yeah, thank you. Okay. That's Sorry helpful. for this, James. Yeah. Uh, no worries. Uh, so everything is subject to Part 15, which is that part of the of the treaty that uh, that provides dispute resolution procedures. Now, there's two things to know concerning this case. The first is that there are different procedures for dispute resolution. You could send this case to the ICJ, but wait a minute, you have to have the consent of the states to go to the ICJ. Likewise, you could send this to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, but that doesn't work because the states are also not consenting. Annex seven arbitration applies when the states cannot choose one of these options. And what that means is that each party picks one arbitrator, and then the president of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea picks three arbitrators. And in this case, China elected not to participate, although it's legally bound to do so. Remember, there's mandatory dispute resolution. It's not optional. So China had no choice but to participate. And if they didn't participate, then the case went on in their absence. And that's what occurred in this case. And so the arbitration panel was convened or impaneled. Now, China's view is that yes, everything is subject to part 15 on dispute resolution, except in those cases when it is not. And there are some exceptions. We'll talk about the first two because China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs claims that in this situation, that's what would apply. China says this case is really about maritime boundaries. It's not about entitlements based on the features, but rather China says you can't really separate out this mess. You can't disentangle China's claim of the nine dash line with the Philippine claim of exclusive economic zone. You can't figure that out unless you know who owns all of those islands. And so first, first of all, it's a boundary issue because one country or another might own those islands and that would create maritime boundary disputes because those islands may be entitled to territorial sea or exclusive economic zone that overlap the Philippine exclusive economic zone. And China claims all of these islands. The other problem that China raises is that this is, China says this is really about historic bays or titles. And under these first two bullets that you see here in article 298 of the treaty, China can accept out or exempt these disputes related to maritime boundaries or historic bays and titles. So China says clearly this is about historic title. China's claiming historic title from the nine dash line. And it's also about maritime boundaries. And because of these two, the interplay of these two factors with the, the law of the sea, that China does not have to participate. It can exercise its optional exception and remove this case from jurisdiction. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is that the case did not deal with 
which country may own all of these features. So there are overlapping claims where the Philippines claims them, Malaysia, Vietnam, Taiwan, China, and the Law of the Sea Convention and the dispute resolution cannot decide, it does not have competence over which country actually may own which feature. So all, of, all the Law of the Sea Convention can do is look at a feature and then determine whether it's entitled to a territorial sea or an exclusive economic zone. The ownership of the feature is a different body of law. This is the body of acquisition. And this is important because la terre domine la mer, the land dominates the sea. And all the maritime zones in the Law of the Sea Convention are predicated from the shoreline. So just like the graphic that I showed you, all of these maritime claims begin at a lawful baseline that normally runs along the low water mark. And from there, states may claim a territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, and the rest. In order to make a maritime claim then, a state has to have title or ownership over a body of land or an island. So just think about it. Uh, Antarctica is a continent and yet no state can claim a territorial sea around Antarctica because no state has lawful title to that land. Land can be acquired through one of these five means. And importantly, just because a country went and visited a place, such as the United States landing on the moon and planting a flag, does not perfect legal title. So China often claims that its fishers have landed on all of these islands throughout the South China Sea for thousands of years. They have been visiting these islands and therefore they belong to China. That's not sufficient to make a claim of title. A claim of title can be made through prescription, number three, which is open usage over a long period of time, or occupation, exercising administration and physical authority. But remember, the Law of the Sea Convention cannot decide which of these, uh, which of these islands, if any, are under title of China. So let's go into the actual case and look at the four separate issues, the four major issues. We'll spend most of our time on the first two. The Philippines made a claim that China, China's historic rights are not compatible with the Law of the Sea Convention. China has this nine dash line as a historic waters claim. And the Philippines argued and was successful that China does not have a lawful claim to historic rights. Why? The bottom line is that historic rights mainly apply to very small bays. It never has applied before to a large body of water like the South China Sea. The South China Sea is 15 times the size of the Persian Gulf. It's mm -hmm. not a insignificant body of water. Second are the status of the features. Are the features entitled to an exclusive economic zone and a continental shelf? If they're not, then even if China owns them, even if China owns all of those islands, at most they would be entitled to a 12 mile territorial sea. If they're only entitled to a 12 mile territorial sea, there's no maritime boundary issue. Can I remind everybody to mute their microphone, please? Can I request uh, participants, please mute your microphones? Uh, you are disturbing uh, somebody with the GRS. Somebody with the GRS. 
<laughs> Maybe James, uh, since you are the host, you can mute that person. Yeah, I'm trying to find yeah. who it is. It's uh, GRS, the first three names. Right. Yeah, thank you. My goodness. Somebody is stuck in traffic. I um, think, yeah. Somebody with the GRS name, can you please uh, unmute your uh, microphone? It's uh, disturbing the speaker. Yeah, I got it. Ah, thank okay. you. All right. Okay. Um, sorry, somehow they dropped. Not saying I removed them, but I did. Okay. So we're going to look at these uh, four issues, and in particular, the main issue. The main issue, China's historic claims. The second issue, the status of the features. Does that sound good? Please. All right. yeah. So the tribunal held that China does not have a lawful claim to historic rights in this nine dash line. Uh, if we look at the regional history, uh, China actually only claimed to the south of the Paracel Islands as late as 1943. You can see here, this is the China Handbook by the Republic of China from 1943. And by 1947, they claimed the Tuancha or Spratly Islands. So China has relatively new claims which probably make historic rights claims unavailable because historic claims tend to be over centuries, not over, say, 50 years. The tribu tribunal said that China was not really making a claim of, of maritime boundaries because it was really a dispute over entitlements. So remember, states can exempt both historic claims and they can, they can exempt claims of maritime boundaries, overlapping maritime boundaries. And in both of these, China has failed to convince the arbitration. The nine dash line is not a lawful claim of maritime boundaries because there are uh, no boundaries that, uh, that that come up against another state. There are no boundaries that exist. Historic boundaries have been, generally have been considered to be historic title claims. That means that uh, if you have a claim of historic title within a historic boundary, an area, this is internal waters. And within internal waters, other states are not allowed to, uh, to conduct activities such as oil and gas activities. And so China has... Uh, Sorry. Guys, so now kindly mute your microphones, please. So China has treated these areas more like an EEZ, but if they were really historic internal waters, then China would not be competing for oil and gas, as you see here. Here, the Chinese overseas oil company has offered leases in, these, in this disputed area. And China also objected to Philippine oil and gas leases. Well, remember, oil and gas leases is a trait or a feature of exclusive economic zone and continental shelf, not internal waters. And historic waters would be internal waters. Similarly, China has enacted a fishing ban, an annual fishing ban in this area, purporting to assert jurisdiction over this area and keeping out foreign flagged ships. 
Now, of course, the problem is, is that China is electing to impose its laws in another country's exclusive economic zone. You can see here with Philippines and Vietnam that are directly affected by this. And so, and so again, the arbitration said that this looks much more like a exclusive economic zone than it does historic internal waters. Likewise, so we have oil and gas, we have fishing, and also freedom of navigation and overflight. There is no right of freedom of navigation and overflight in historic internal waters or any type of internal waters. If you want to overfly the internal waters of a country, you have to get the consent or the permission of that country. And yet in this case of the South China Sea, China has often stated that they, uh, that they recognize freedom of navigation and overflight, and that all countries may exercise these rights in the South China Sea. So this looks much more like the exclusive economic zone where you do have navigational rights and freedoms rather than an historic waters claim. Sorry, Joycey, please mute your microphone. Joycey. Joycey. Sorry for this, James. I think no there's in intermittent disturbances. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, you can. I just don't see. Uh, I can mute, but I can't really find um, yeah. who they are going, going through everybody. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe. <laughs> How about I just uh, continue? Yeah, please. Yeah, so with, with oil and gas, with fishing and with freedom of navigation, China acts like this area is an exclusive economic zone rather than historic internal waters. And so that is, uh, that is why uh, the tribunal ruled that these are really not historic waters claims that China is making within the nine dash line. Now, further, the tribunal said that, uh, that China's own diplomacy suggests that these, this nine dash line is also not historic waters, internal waters, because of not only its commitment to FAN or freedom of navigation, but China has straight baselines within the nine dash line. And so it's an illogical situation to have straight baselines that depict uh, internal waters within the nine dash line that is also internal waters. And therefore, uh, the straight baselines that China has around Hainan Island, as well as the Paracel Islands in the north, the Paracel Islands in the north, uh, which I can show you on this graphic, that indicates that China does not uh, consider all of this yellow uh, dashed line as historic waters because China has uh, a historic waters claim around Hainan Island here and then also around all of the Paracel Islands. Can you see my cursor okay? Yeah. Okay. So China already has those smaller historic uh, claims and therefore it would be illogical if those were within the uh, the yellow nine dash line also being historic waters. Finally, the tribunal says, look, historic waters claims have to meet a three part test, a three part test. That's the first box up here. There's no treaty that, that codifies this three part test, but the three part test is that a state must exercise authority over an area of water. It has to do so for a continuous amount of time. Remember, China only made these claims 
from 1947. And it also has to have a positive attitude or acquiescence of foreign states. And the tribunal said that that's, that's the three-part test that you need in order to make an historic rights claim. And all three of those are absent in this case. And that this historic waters claim really means internal waters. Internal waters are, are like what you have in a port. They're landward of the baseline. They're close to the land, such as a port. And over this area, no state can enter because it's like entering the territory. It isn't entering the territory of the country. So with, with all of these factors, the tribunal said that the Law of the Sea Convention is a system of zones. That graphic that I put up with the baselines, the territorial sea, the exclusive economic zone, the continental shelf, this is a comprehensive system of zones. And that any other kind of unique, historic type of claim that China's making, it is, is superseded by the Law of the Sea Convention. Any historic claims of the distance past, those are incompatible with the new law of the sea in which coastal states are entitled to an exclusive economic zone. China says, yes, but wait, we've been fishing in this area for many years. And the tribunal said, that's true. But when you did so, that was before the law of the sea convention and you were exercising your high seas freedom. Because the law of the sea convention that was adopted in 1982 and entered force in 1994, created the exclusive economic zone. Before that, there was no EEZ. And therefore, Chinese or Vietnamese or American, Japanese fishing vessels, all these fishing vessels were fishing in this area. They were exercising their high seas freedoms. And it's only after creation of the EEZ that those fishers have been displaced. Now, on uh, further on that, not only are Chinese fishers and other fishers displaced from the Philippine EEZ, but remember, all the other countries are also displaced from China's EEZ. China gained its own EEZ and it gave up the right to fish in other countries' EEZ. And so this is part of the comprehensive package deal of the Law of the Sea Convention. The Law of the Sea Convention supersedes any earlier legal claims. Finally, on this issue, the arbitration looked at the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 30. Article 30 says when you are trying to figure out how to interpret a treaty, you look toward the object and purpose of the treaty. And in this case, the object and purpose of the treaty, the object and purpose of the treaty uh, is to uh, hold on, I'm going to mute some of our friends. Thanks for joining, but I know the traffic is tough. Um, the object and purpose of the treaty is to create a stable framework in which coastal states enjoy certain rights and flag states, user states enjoy certain rights. So China's fishers do have certain rights. What are they? They're the right to fish exclusively in its own EZ, or maybe by agreement in some other coastal state. If China wanted to pay a coastal state, then it could, um, of course it could do so if it wanted to. All right. This understanding of the dominant position of the EZ was China's position during the negotiations for the Law of the Sea Convention, and during its bilateral discussions with its neighbors, both the Philippines and Vietnam. So it's a little ironic 
that China is now claiming that there is this new regime of historic rights when its past diplomacy, the diplomatic record, indicates that China understood that the Law of the Sea Convention creates the EEZ and the EEZ replaces any earlier, uh, any earlier understanding. Okay, let's look at the second issue. We'll look at it for maybe about 10 minutes and then we're gonna open it up to questions. So in summary, the first issue is that there are no historic rights within this dashed line. China says that there are historic rights. If there are historic rights or historic title, then China under Article 298 could claim that there's no jurisdiction because issues of historic title under Part 15 under Article 298 can be taken out of the jurisdiction of the arbitration panel. The second way that China could remove jurisdiction is to say that there's a maritime boundary dispute. And this might occur where Chinese maritime boundaries over say it's EEZ conflict with Philippine maritime boundaries over its EEZ. That second issue is predicated on the status of the features. Are there any features in the South China Sea that might create a maritime boundary dispute. There's four types of features, four types of features uh, in, in this area, in, in the law of the sea generally, and of course that apply here. The first are submerged features. Submerged features are part of the continental shelf and they cannot generate any type of maritime claim. The second type of feature is a low tide elevation. Now a submerged feature is always underwater. It's an underwater rock or mountain and it's always underwater, part of the continental shelf. Now, if it's beyond 12 miles, no country can own title to a submerged feature. What does the coastal state enjoy? The coastal state enjoys over sub submerged features they enjoy sovereign rights and jurisdiction over the living and non-living resources, like oil and gas or uh, lobsters and crabs and that sort of thing. But they don't actually own the area. They only own or have title out to 12 nautical miles. So a submerged feature has no entitlement for any type of zone in the Law of the Sea Convention. Well, let's look at the second type, LTE. This is a low tide elevation. That's kind of uh, common in the South China Sea. It's what you see in this picture. A low tide elevation is an area that is above water at low tide. When the tide goes out, the feature is above water. It's also called a drying reef, where the reef gets dry, but then the tide comes in and it goes under the water. It's a low tide elevation, elevated at low tide. Low tide elevations, if they're in the middle of the ocean, also are not entitled to a territorial sea. Now, there are some exceptions near the shore under Article 13 where you, of the Law of the Sea Convention, where you have a low tide elevation that is within 12 miles of the mainland or an island. And in that case, only in that case, you can use a low tide elevation to generate a territorial sea. But generally, submerged features and low tide elevations are not even entitled to a territorial sea, a 12 mile territorial sea. Islands, islands are entitled to a 12 mile territorial sea and a 200 mile exclusive economic zone. And so China says, even if you disagree with our nine dash line, even if, we, even if we understand that you're not going to accept our historic claim within the nine dash line, our historic internal waters claim, we get it that that does not prevail. But 
China's second argument is that all those islands belong to China. And all those islands are entitled to a 200 mile exclusive economic zone. And, and if they are entitled to a 200 mile exclusive economic zone, then that creates a genuine issue of maritime boundary overlap. How does that work? Well, let's take a blank slate. You have the South China Sea here. These are the mainland and the coasts. And there are numerous of these little black dots, these disputed islands that are out there. The countries in the area can draw a baseline around their, their coastlines. And in the case of the Philippines and Indonesia, they have a special rule that allows them to draw straight baselines around their entire country because they are archipelagic states. India, United States, China does not have that privilege because we're not countries that are composed entirely of islands like the Philippines and Indonesia. So those are the straight baselines. Now there are some other countries that have internal waters claims that I'm populating right there. And these are not in accordance with the law of the sea convention. In particular, you see Vietnam has an excessive or unlawful claim of uh, out into the water here. And these are the Paracel Islands that China has drawn straight baselines around, okay? Now, this is an overlay. You see these yellow circles. These are all of the main islands, mainly these in the south are Spratly Islands. And they are entitled to it, if they're dry, they're entitled to a 12 nautical mile claim. And then just for fun, we have China's nine dash line here. So you look at these 12 nautical mile island features out there, but China's argument is regardless of the legality of the nine dash line, look what happens if you consider those 12 nautical mile islands to be entitled to an EZ, the major features. Then suddenly you've got an overlap with the Philippine Exclusive Economic Zone. And that is the second basis for disagreeing with jurisdiction that China claimed, is that, you, that China has these islands, these islands are entitled to an exclusive economic zone, and therefore there's a maritime boundary dispute, and that puts us back to Article 298, where China can exempt itself from the jurisdiction. So you see how confusing this case is in that the case on the merits and the case on jurisdiction are interlinked for both of these two big issues. So the tribunal has to determine that there is no maritime boundary dispute in order to keep jurisdiction. And so what did it do? It determined that, that none of those features are an island that can that is entitled to a 200 mile easy. What it said is that all these islands are mere rocks. And a mere rock is only entitled to a 12 mile territorial sea, not a 200 mile exclusive economic zone. So the tribunal said, it's going to look at all of these features as merely rocks. What's the difference between a rock and a regular island? Well, a rock is an island, a subset of island. It's a special type of island that cannot sustain human habitation or an economic life of its own under Article 121, Paragraph 3. So the tribunal said that all of those features out there are merely rocks because they cannot sustain human habitation or an economic life of their own. And the difference in jurisdiction between a rock and an island is that all islands get a 12 mile territorial sea, but only those islands that can sustain human habitation or an economic life of their own get this other large area of exclusive economic zone. That, that I showed you on the graphic. That would create a maritime boundary dispute. 
The tribunal said none of these features meet that test, that all of them are incapable of sustaining human habitation or an economic life of their own. And importantly, what it said is that uh, economic life of their own means that there is a functioning economy on the island, that it is an organic functioning economy. So just stationing troops on these uh, artificial islands, rocks, does not count. Temporary stationing of troops doesn't count. You have to have organic people that are living there in functioning communities that are not dependent on the outside. They have a organic source of fresh water that is well water from a well, not from you know, collected rainwater or bottled, bottled water from you know, human sources. It has to be able to function entirely on its own. It's not dependent on external trade. So China over, understands all of this, and you have probably seen, I'll end with, with this uh, uh, graphic of how China has transformed uh, these islands. The final point I'll make is what in the world do you do if all those islands are owned by China, but they're within the Philippine exclusive economic zone? And what the court did is what it has done many times is it enclaved them, enclave. It enclaves them. What that means is that, uh, that it, it allows Chinese islands with a 12 mile territorial sea to be floating in, surrounded by Philippine exclusive economic zone. Just like it did in this case in the International Court of Justice between Colombia and Nicaragua. You can see here, I drew a big blue circle around these two features, Quitsueno and Serrano. Quitsueno and Serrano. This is what they look like. And those features are actually owned by Colombia, but they're within Nicaragua's exclusive economic zone. And what the court did is it drew a 12 mile red 12 mile territorial sea around those features. Within the 12 miles, that is Colombia's territorial sea. Outside of 12 miles, they're within Nicaragua's exclusive economic zone. And that's what the court did in this case. And China has, uh, I'm gonna flick through these very fast, like, like, um, like stop motion uh, movie. So you can see the transformation that China has done in just a very short time on one of these seven features. This is Fiery Cross Reef from August of 2014 over the period of about 18 months as China tries to make this small sandbar into an island that can sustain human habitation or an economic life of its own in order to bolster its claim that, that it has a, a maritime boundary dispute. So look at this just phenomenal kind of horrifying engineering where it uh, created massive destruction of the coral reef, um, destroying 150 pound giant clams that uh, take 150 years to grow. Uh, China used dynamite to, to blow out these uh, areas, creating these massive artificial islands that you have probably seen in the media. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing. There were some other features of the case. The case was 500 pages long, but these were the two major issues. And these were the only issues that could defeat jurisdiction. And the court ruled that it had jurisdiction. There was no jurisdictional dispute that prevailed for uh, China and, uh, and, and, and that uh, the Philippines prevailed and China has uh, ignored the dispute, but nonetheless, the, uh, the case is final and binding on China from a legal standpoint. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm glad to, Dr. Chaka, back to you. Yeah. Dr. Chaka, I'm glad to take any thoughts or questions. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, indeed, it's a very, very wonderful uh, 
illumination of the facts and law of this very critical case. First, let me admit, when I was reading this uh, South China disputes arbitration, and I was not at all clear because of so many nuances which we are not able to understand. But today, and I must confess that I was uh, much more wiser than what I was in this particular South China dispute. You have made it a very good attempt of uh, dealing with this. Thank you so much, Professor James. And the second important thing, I have a question. Maybe I am asking this question to uh, facilitate my students also, because we are dealing with international law and also the customary principles of international law. In one occasion, China has uh, constantly talking about uh, coexistence of uh, customary principles of international law, particularly the regional custom which they have related to historic Chinese claim on South China disputes. And they have come out with that one proposition that is, we must respect Chinese claims on South China Sea on the basis of their historical claims. And it must coexist with the UNCLOS, that is United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. What is your take on this, Professor James? Oh, thank you very much. It's a great question. Um, so two points. The first is that the regional custom absolutely is uh, permissive in the in international law and the law of the sea. If India and Sri Lanka and Mauritius and other Indian Ocean nations want to have a legal norm that departs from the global position and it's a regional rule, then that is fine. There's nothing at all wrong with it. No, the, the two issues are number one, it doesn't affect third states. So India cannot claim the Indian Ocean. Furthermore, India, Sri Lanka, and Mauritius and Seychelles and Madagascar cannot claim the Indian Ocean. They might make any agreement they want among themselves, but they can't affect the rights of third states or supersede the global rules for third states. Remember, international law binds, uh, binds countries based upon the accepted norms of the community. Furthermore, uh, China, in fact, could have a regional rule if the region agreed with China. But all those other states in the region don't agree with China on the nine dash line. So, you know, it would be like the United States claiming the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico and saying it's a regional rule but the, the smaller states in the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico uh, would say, no, we don't agree. So if there's just one large country, then that's not a regional, uh, uh, that's not a regional arrangement. That's not a regional uh, framework. That's one country trying to boss the, the smaller countries. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, the second question, and uh, for this last question from my side, that is, uh, since China is a very expeditiously and a very fast manner, they try to just to change entire the natural habitation of this island. How do you see that uh, uh, as a kind of a violation and changing the geography of a particular island, which is acceptable under international law of the sea, in your opinion? Yeah, it's a great question. So just in the interest of time, um, I, I didn't mention that, first of all, when you look at the islands, they have to be viewed in their natural state. You cannot artificially develop a massive artificial island and then claim that it is a functioning island with a 200 mile exclusive economic zone, even though this appears to be what China is doing. More importantly, to get to your question about marine environmental protection. Under Article 192 and 194 of the Law of the Sea Convention, all states have a duty to protect the marine environment. And this includes a number of obligations. And the tribunal found in uh, Section 3 that we didn't have time to talk about, that in building these artificial islands, China had an appalling 
impact on the on the uh, on the uh, marine environment in this area, and uh, destroying huge numbers of coral reefs that take literally hundreds of years to repopulate. Uh, in particular, there is a requirement, an additional requirement, to be transparent and to conduct an environmental impact assessment of anything that would disturb the natural environment. And China failed to do so. Not only did it not conduct an environmental impact assessment of its own, but it also failed in its obligation or its duty to be transparent to its neighbors and share this information with its neighbors. So there, there's a large catalog of offenses in the, the convention, in the uh, uh, arbitration ruling that indicates China did things like using dynamite to blow up the coral reefs, used cyanide, cyanide fishing, pouring cyanide in the water so the fish rise to the surface, uh, chopping up the coral reef using the propellers of fishing vessels, grinding them up, uh, a lot of uh, destructive practices and uh, damaging the, the coral reef as well as killing numerous endangered species in the area. Very good. Thank you so much. It is uh, really nice. Now I would request uh, our participants and students. Uh, is anyone have a pertinent question? If you have any, you can unmute your video and audio you can ask. Don't hesitate. You have anything, or otherwise you can leave it. Uh, your question in the chat box. I can read it out for James. People are too shy, but there's there's no stupid question. Probably uh, twenty people have the same question. If you have a question, and if I'm glad to further explain something if I wasn't clear, because I know we have a limited time. I'll tell you, I normally teach this over three hours at Harvard Law School. So <laughs> you should not be shy if you have some confusion because we went quite quickly and it's quite a complex uh, area of law. Yeah. So I'm glad to take any questions. We have two questions, James. One is that uh, from Wasim Akram. What could be the possible steps that can be taken to settle the South China Sea dispute? Well, the Philippines has already done uh, the first few steps. Always when there's a dispute, conciliation is also part of uh, the law of the sea dispute resolution. Conciliation is like marriage counseling. It's getting the parties together and having them talk it out. And the Philippines did this for about 15 years before they filed the case. And then there are the dispute resolution procedures that I showed you, International Court of Justice, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. There's Annex 7 arbitration. There's Annex 8 arbitration. Both of these arbitrations um, are useful, uh, but we have already had an Annex 7 arbitration. That is the mechanism or the tool, the instrument to use when there is lack of agreement over how to go forward. That's how China that didn't agree on going forward got drawn into the case because Annex 7 arbitration is the default mechanism. What can be done going forward? Uh, I have suggested and other people have suggested that Vietnam should file a similar claim. You have to build the normative power, by normative, I mean the legally influential principles. You have to build the normative power uh, of the conventional law of the sea. If we want to have a stable regime or set of rules for the law of the sea, we have to continue to build it. And China has not, um, has not backed away from its claims. It's adjusted them a little bit, but it basically has the same claims. So in my view, what would be helpful is first for Vietnam and then even for Malaysia, for even for Indonesia and Brunei. If all of these uh, states brought an Annex 7 arbitration, China must participate. 
or it will receive a default judgment, just like it did in the Philippine case. And can you imagine the normative power if there's two, three, four more cases that show China? Because China, uh, the Communist Party has to try to explain how, it's, how the world is reacting to its overreach or its dominance in this area. And, it's, and at some point, it becomes more and more difficult for a regime that closes off external news media to explain why these other countries are all opposing what China is doing. And this eventually gets to the people in China. And that's how I think that you bring pressure to bear on China, the same way that you do with an authoritarian state like Russia, in which the people mostly do not understand what their government is doing. And that's clearly the case with China that has a closed media, a massive firewall, it prevents external media. Uh, you, you know, in India, you can, uh, you can access global media, but that's not uh, a privilege that, uh, that your counterparts across the border uh, share. So they're only getting one perspective. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, guys, uh, you have to mute your audio, Sandilia. Thank you. Uh, James, we have one more question that is uh, from uh, Mr. Kulaseka. Artificial expansion of coastal extent would alter the continental shelf and the EZ, like a Colombo port city in Sri Lanka. What's your take on it? Yeah, it doesn't really prolong the continental shelf because the work is on the continental shelf. And so the, the outer edge of the continental shelf is you know, some 100, 200, 350, 400 miles out. So it's not actually extending the continental shelf. Now, if you say that you are adding to the land territory and therefore at, you know, the, at the edge of 200 miles, you're pushing that farther out, uh, the land territory can actually affect the baseline. There are uh, reasonable disputes and I think that there is a reasonableness test. So if a country adds 200 meters to its, to its shoreline, it puts in a new port facility and adds 200 meters to its shoreline, does that extend out the EEZ you know, 200 meters farther out? That's a legitimate dispute. The continental shelf though is already there. It's a natural prolongation of the continental margin. So you can't grow that because that's just rock on the seabed. But what you could do is you could say, well, look, I'm entitled to a 200 mile EZ. And because I expanded my port 200 meters, now I get 200 miles plus an additional 200 meters. That might be a legitimate dispute, but so far it hasn't really become an issue. Okay. I think we'll take the last question uh, from Shilpa. Since China is not accepting the arbitration rule or decision, can any action be initiated against China? Well, you know that we, we live in a, in a world of sovereign states in which there is not, not any higher authority than the sovereignty of the state. This came out of the Peace of Westphalia and the modern international law beginning in 1648 and is recognized as a principle of international law. There are very few exceptions to this. For example, if the UN Security Council acts under chapter seven, it may uh, bypass or penetrate the sovereignty of the state. But we're not going to have that in this case because of course China has a permanent veto on the Security Council. So what does that uh, leave us with? What action can be initiated against China? Um, the same action that can be initiated against a state that imposes harmful costs or damages on another state. And this is the law of state responsibility. And this is underutilized in my view. So the Philippines has suffered an internationally wrongful act. By having its, uh, by having its um, uh, continental shelf converted into artificial islands, by China's violation 
of navigational rights, oil and gas rights, fishing rights, environmental rights. Philippines has suffered a series of internationally wrongful acts, meaning that there is no legal justification for what China has done. Similarly, India has suffered internationally wrongful acts uh, on the border, even if those acts by China do not rise to the level of an armed attack against China, but they are wrongful. So what should countries do that face these grievances? In my view, they should impose countermeasures. Countermeasures are lawful uh, measures that suspend legal obligations and allow an aggrieved country to suspend legal obligations against, uh, against the, the country that imposed the harmful uh, conduct in order to induce compliance on the part of China. And if I were, and also the United States has suffered internationally wrongful acts, continual cyber attacks on our companies, on our government, um, all of these things, in my view, uh, are re required that there are countermeasures and to be powerful, they ought to be collective countermeasures where states that are suffering the same types of uh, harmful, wrongful acts by China get together and all agree on certain countermeasures to induce compliance on the part of the Communist Party in China. Great, thank you. I think, uh, can we take one last question from our student, uh, Mr. Joel? Yes. yes sir. Uh, can you unmute uh, your video also? Yeah. Hi, sir. Hi, Joel. Um, hi, good morning. And once, uh, I, I have a question for you. Like, uh, so there's, there's been a clashes between US and China on the basis of uh south uh south uh sea china so does un is giving any response to that and if it is giving what kind of steps is un is taking on that thing are you asking if the united nations is taking any steps yeah yeah no i mean sadly you know the united nations has not really become involved and uh diplomatically as, as you know china has become very powerful in the united nations um, it chairs four of 15 international organizations uh, in the UN system. And China is a master, probably the best in the world at buying off uh, and uh, spreading money around in order to ensure that it maintains a, you know, a stronger diplomatic position. So the United Nations has not taken any action. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Sir. Uh, yeah, That's thank good. you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor James. And indeed, it's a very wonderful session. And uh, unfortunately, due to paucity of time, we are not able to continue the discussion. And uh, certainly, we would like to have your session one more time, maybe physically in the near future. And hopefully, the pandemic will be easing out. We will uh, definitely have you with us. And we will continue to have a cooperation both uh, bilaterally with you personally and with the institution which you belong. And with this, I thank you personally. And also I thank on behalf of VAT AP School of Law, VAT University and our chancellor, vice chancellor and they all communicate, uh, convey their regards and heartfelt gratitude to you. And also I thank our participants and students staying in the late evening and attending this in a important and wonderful tag. Thank you so much, uh, Professor James. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can uh, we can close. I think you are the host. You will have to close. Uh, yeah. I will. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.